All right. We'll go back to Luke 4.13 and Ecclesiastes uh, 3.1. We'll read those scriptures again and we'll continue uh, the message, the sixth season of temptation. Now, in Luke 4.13, the Bible says, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, that he departed from Jesus for a season. Then in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, verse 1, the Bible says, To everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven. Father, thank you for your precious word and help us glean truth from its riches as you speak to our heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to reintroduce the message to you, but I will remind you that uh, our battle is not against the flesh and blood. Our battle is against uh, spiritual power and wickedness. And this morning we learned that temptation comes in many ways. We learned that, first of all, uh, comes from... Uh, or usually comes right after salvation. The first season of temptation is immediately following our conversion. And then we also learn that the second season of temptation is usually uh, during the pain of life. So I want to continue and I want to carry you to the third season. Now the third season is usually going to take place at the beginning of a great victory. So the third season of temptation takes place when you and I are about to embark on some great victory. Now, you need to understand that the devil can sense when God is about to bring you into some great state of revival or victory in your life. While Satan cannot read your mind or even read God's intent, he can see the patterns of, that are taking place. And when the devil begins to notice the potential for a spiritual victory to take place, it's then that he will go on the attack. Now, in Genesis chapter 49, verse 17, it talks about the adder or the snake in the path that bites the horse's heel so that the rider falls off backward. You see, the devil goes on the attack constantly. He's going to be that adder that bites the horse's heel to cause you to fall off. He, uh, he's going to be on the attack and he's going to be alert to the fact that something significant is about to take place in your life. He'll send a, Tob a Tobiah and a Sanballat to mock the wall builder. Uh, he'll put a Paul and Barnabas uh, at odds with one another uh, and cause them to part ways. This is just the way the devil works. The devil doesn't want to, uh, anything to move forward for the glory of God. The devil wants everything to fall back. The devil doesn't, doesn't want you to experience a, a wonderful victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. So at the beginning of what looks like uh, is going to be a big victory in your life, look out, Satan, like a roaring lion, is coming and to devour. Now you got to remember how Satan attacked the Lord Jesus Christ in the beginning of his ministry and he assailed him throughout his ministry and then he bitterly attacked the Lord at the end of his ministry. Remember that the more prominent that a person may be, always remember this, the more prominent that a person may be Somebody that may be placed into leadership. Somebody that may 
have influence or spiritual authority. The devil will do his best, my friend, to fracture these to a point of failure. You know, there's nothing the devil likes anymore than seeing a man of God fall away and do something that's ungodly that will scar his testimony. You better understand this. You, as a child of God, you built a testimony. And the devil will do everything in his power to destroy your testimony. Now, you will discover more often than not uh, that uh, just before God is going to do something great in your life, you will uh, uh, weather a storm. There will be a storm and shakings that will attempt to rattle your faith. No matter what may come, listen, you can't quit. Because that's what the devil wants you to do, is quit. The storm may be hard. The storm may be heavy. But you can have victory if you keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the third season of uh, temptation is just before a great victory may come. Now the fourth season of temptation will take place when the devil puts objects near us that will cause us to fall. You see, the devil knows exactly what to put in front of us, objects that will cause us to fall. You got to stop and think about that for just a moment. When he tempted Eve and brought her to fall, what did he use? He used a tree with fruit on it. It was something near that he took advantage of tempting her with. She was near the tree, and then she put her eyes on the tree, and then the dialogue with the devil started. I'm going to tell you something. You need to know this. The devil will talk to you. Just like the Lord will talk to you, the devil will talk to you too. You don't believe it, ask Eve. <laughs> ask Eve. The devil talked to her. And listen, the fact is that when he gets into our eyes, when he gets into our eyes, it's then that he begins to find his way into our heart. And let me tell you this. You've heard me say it so many times before, but I'm going to say it again. He knows exactly what to put in front of you to get into your eyes and to get into your mind and to move into your heart. Now, it was an inordinate desire for Eve. Eve started looking at something she thought she could have and she failed. Now, when we get into a conversation of rationalizing and justifying our evil actions, well, we see enough of that going on today, don't we? It won't be long before we fall into temptation. Think about it for just a moment. What did the devil say to Eve? God told you you couldn't eat that tree, the fruit of that tree. Look how luscious it looks. It's a tree that will make you like God. You'll know good from evil. And God surely would have for you to know all of these things. Oh, look at that fruit. How wonderful and luscious it is. And what did she do? She fell for the snares of the devil. You have got to fight. It's spiritual warfare. Whatever it is that Satan puts in front of your face for you to look at that will cause you to lose sight of Jesus, you've got to fight. I mean, you stop and you think about it. Jesus had fed a multitude and he sent his disciples on across the sea and uh, he went into a mountain place to pray and to uh, refresh himself and to talked to his father. He came off of the mountain, the, the ships in the midst of the sea, and the Bible says Jesus starts walking to the disciples on the water. And the disciples see him coming and they cry out in fear, saying it's a ghost. 
And Jesus says, have no fear. It is I. And Peter said, you know, that sounds like Jesus. Lord, if that's really you, let me step out of the boat and walk out there to you on the water. Now, preachers are real quick to criticize Peter and talk about his little faith, but at least he had enough faith to step out of the boat. I don't read that the others stepped out of the boat. But Peter did. And he started walking out to Jesus. The devil don't like it when you're walking toward Jesus. The devil don't like it whenever you're living for Jesus. The devil don't like it whenever you're doing your best for Jesus. So he's going to cause something to come along and get your attention. Now he's a powerful foe. The Bible says that he caused a storm, and that storm caused Peter to lose sight of Jesus. And when he got his eyes on the storm, he fell into the water. He began to sink. Now, in my own mind's eye, I kind of see him about nose deep before he regains his composure and he regains his sight of Jesus, and he cries out, Lord, save me. Now listen, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that there may not have been times in even my own life that I have lost sight of Christ, and I took a bad fall. But always remember just in time, and cried out, Lord, save me. You see, that's exactly what we have to do when we're dealing with spiritual warfare. When we know that we're powerless over our adversary, we serve one who is powerful Amen. and who can defeat him. Do you think Satan was happy whenever Peter regained his composure and he regained his sight of Jesus? I believe Satan would have loved to have drowned Peter in the midst of the sea. But you see, Jesus knew that he had great work for Peter to do. The fact that gets into our eyes and finds its way into our heart will destroy us if we don't fight against it. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, the Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of of life. In Proverbs 23, 19, the Bible says, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible says, Set your affections, set thine affections on things above and not things of the earth. That's important. What are some of the things of the earth seemingly that gets our attention? Well, there's one going on this evening. I mean, there's churches that's closed their doors so that their membership can see the Super Bowl. But preacher, that doesn't happen but one time a year. I'd rather be with Super Jesus than with a Super Bowl. I mean, that's just one thing. There's so many other things that we could talk about. What is it that, that, that we set our affection on that causes us to lose sight of Jesus? Well, Judas fell because of his money bag. You ever thought about that? One of the greatest temptations that people have to deal with who have problems with gambling is riding up and down the highways seeing that mega million dollar sign. Thinking that they're going to be made rich overnight. And if you're a child of God, you're already rich. You're rich in things that this world can't even begin to comprehend. 
I know a family right now, right now I know a family that will go without food to buy scratch-off tickets thinking that they're going to get rich quick. That's just one thing. And there's so many other things that, that people have to deal with. The things that, that Satan has, has thrown in front of their face to cause them to lose sight of the faith that they, that they have. To lose sight of Jesus. There's people that lose sight of Jesus because of a medication bottle. There's people that lose sight of Jesus because of a package of cigarettes. There's people that lose sight of Jesus and the list could go on and on and on. And don't look spiritual like you don't have a habit. I have one three times a day. Starts at breakfast. Goes into the dinner hour. Yes, I said dinner because I'm from the country. We still eat dinner at my house. We have supper at night. Three times a day. I've got a habit. In fact, my habit got so bad till I told folk that I don't have to eat but one meal a day. Starts at six in the morning, ends at midnight. But you see, those are just some of the things that cause us to fall away from our faith and not be where we ought to be with God. There's some people love television more than they do the Bible. Oh, preacher, you meddling now. But it's the truth. Uh, Esau fell in love with a bowl of stew. Sold his birthright. Demas fell in love with the world. Achan fell because of his longing for a wedge of gold and a garment. God told him he couldn't have it, but he took it anyway. Listen to me. You can count on it. The devil will place things in your way that will be intoxicating to you. He'll try to get you to take it. He'll try to get you to use it. He'll try to get you to get it. Why is he doing it? Because he wants to destroy, listen, your spiritual health. He wants to destroy that. He wants to destroy your spiritual health. Now the fifth season of temptation will take place when you receive the great grace and the mercy of God. Now listen. Some of you may refer to this also as the AI principle. You see, after you have experienced a great demonstration of the love of God, after you have experienced uh, uh, the great grace of God, after you have experienced uh, the power of God in your life, the devil will come and attack with fierce temptations. More saints of God, listen, find themselves in a place of spiritual relaxation after these moments in time. In my research, I come across an article that was written by a, name, a man by the name of William Gurnall. He lived from the year 1616 to October of 1679. Listen to what he said. He said, if God smiled and opened himself a little familiar to us, then we become prone to grow high and wanting. In other words, when God pours his spirit into you, don't let God's spirit make you heady and high-minded. If he frown, then we sink as much in our faith. Thus the one like fair weather and warm gleams bring up weeds of corruption, and the other like sharp frost nips and even kills the flower of grace. Look at the life of Peter in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. One minute, Peter has a grand revelation. The next minute, the Lord Jesus is calling him the devil. Isn't that something? Look at Joseph in Genesis. One moment, he is flushed with the pride of his father's love. And he wears his coat of many colors. 
boasting before his brethren. The next moment, he's sold off into slavery by jealous brothers. Look at the children of Israel, the collapsing walls of Jericho. Then, after they've celebrated that great victory, they're rattled by a lesser opponent called Ai. You see, the devil sometimes will try to make you so heavenly minded that you know earthly good. You ever been there? You ever thought so much in your spirituality that nobody else could be as spiritual as you are? Don't look at me spiritual like you hadn't done it. Kind of reminds me of the time I asked my wife, honey, how many great preachers do you think we have in the United States? And she said, one less than you do. Let the air out of my balloon. Look at Moses receiving the law of God on the mountain of God, thickened by the glory of God, face shining so brightly that they had to veil it when he came down, only to see them lurking in their sinfulness and throwing the tablets of God that God had written with his own finger, throwing them down and destroying them foot of the mountain. And then what did he have to do? He had to go back and get some new ones. You see, that's the way the devil works. He'll take your growing spirituality and use it against you if you let him. I try to handle the devil this way when I get there. I remind Satan that while I may be growing in my spirituality, while I may be getting closer to the God I love, while I may continue to study and learn about him, I haven't arrived yet, Satan. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Don't let the devil make you think that you're more spiritual than you really are because without Jesus, you wouldn't be spiritual anyway. Amen. And in the sixth season, comes at the moment of death. The sixth season of temptation will take place when we reach the hour of death. Now listen. When a saint of God is down to his last moments of life, many times he may feel stricken in body by pain. And the loss of strength may discourage the saint of God. They will many times cowardly temper one last time. Probably the greatest illustration of this is found in uh, the fear that Bunyan described in the Pilgrim's Progress. How many of you have ever read Pilgrim's Progress? Anybody? Now listen. The Christian had to swim across the river to get to the celestial city. He saw the brightness of the heavenly city, but the challenge was the deep, swift, flowing river that was between him and the city. I've stood by the bedside of many a saint of God and watched them cross from this side of eternity to the next side. And there seemingly has always been a battle. Always been a battle. The fight and the struggle to stay here. The fight and the struggle not to have to go through the river. None of us look forward to having to go through that river. I remember walking into the home of a man who was dying with terminal cancer. And one of the questions we were always taught to ask was, are you afraid to die? And I had one man to answer me like this, and I liked it. He said, preacher, I don't know, I ain't never died before. <laughs> I said, that's a pretty good answer. But you see, God doesn't want you and I to be afraid of the river. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, it comforts me. Steve, there's a song we sing, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. You see, 
The devil tries to scare us to death because he throws that river in front of us, those swift waters that, that's between us and, and God's heavenly city. But friend, listen to me. There can be a rising confidence in knowing that we can look back over our lives and realize that it's not been wasted. We've lived it faithfully for the Lord. And so we won't have to cross Jordan alone. And I don't know about you, but glory to God, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why? Because he's going to be there with me to help me cross Paul wasn't afraid. The devil thought he had won a battle when Paul laid down his life. But Paul said, I am now ready to be offered. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, he said, I am ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. Uh, hey, you see, that's what we've got to do. I think that we have made it too easy along the Christian walk's way. And I blame some of my peers and myself, the preachers of the gospel, for not letting people know that this is a fight. Boy, there's nothing like being saved. There's nothing like knowing that you're going to go to heaven. But friend, let me tell you something. When you get saved by the grace of God, you've entered a battle. You've entered a fight devil didn't bother you too much before you got saved, did he? But has he bothered you since you got saved? Think about that. And hey, if he's not bothering you very much, he might have you where he wants you. You see, if he can get you on the sidelines out of the battle, then he's won a victory. Paul said, I fought a good fight. Will you be able to say like Paul, I fought a good fight? I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. And now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me, and not to me only, but to, to all of those who love his appearing. Now, he's talking about us right there. And one last thing that I want to share with you about temptation. You can be an overcomer. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation, listen, will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The greatest escape that you and I have when the devil knocks on our door is to simply say, Lord, would you mind getting that door for me? God will help you win your battle. Now don't think you can win your battle by yourself. You can't. Because this battle is the Lord's. And he'll carry you through this battle. But the key to your getting through the battle of temptation is to keep your eyes on Jesus. Stand with me. Father, thank you so much for the message, for the reminder that we need you in these battles that we fight with the enemy. God, help us to know our enemy and to know what we need to do to be overcomers. In Jesus' name, amen.